Every spiritual tradition develops both an exoteric and an esoteric pathway. The exoteric or the outer path becomes necessary when the spiritual lineage begins to attract lower caliber intelligences who take for granted the egoic frame of reference and have great difficulty letting go of that. And so, therefore, they require a path that begins with accepting the assumption that your ego is real, you're a bodily being, you have to make effort to transform yourself, you have to go through all of these ascetic processes, you have to make sacrifices, you have to uh, grow up, you have to do all of these kinds of uh, processes of purification. And uh, this can take years and lifetimes because you're a sinner and you're impure and you have karma, etc., etc. This is the uh, pathway of illusion. And even though in this uh, external exoteric path it is claimed to the effect, seek and thou shalt find... The truth is, if you seek, you will not find. And those who recognize that their seeking just creates more seeking will eventually realize that they must leave behind the exoteric path that they may have become very attached to because it has all kinds of apparatuses you can enjoy, rituals and rosaries and candles you can light and masses you can attend and uh, moon dances and uh, ceremonies of all kinds and exotic substances you can take to alter your state of consciousness temporarily, etc., etc. You can do all kinds of things in the exoteric path and have a lot of fun. But what you won't achieve is liberation from the illusion because you are in effect making the choice to enjoy the illusion. Now, when someone gets serious and wants to get out of the illusion, they have to realize that it is an illusion. And once you realize that it is an illusion, then the portal to the esoteric, I won't even call it a pathway, because there is no path. It's simply a realization. It's instantaneous. Because the ego, being illusory, being unreal, does not exist. And therefore, whatever tendencies it has, whatever impurities, whatever narratives, whatever sins it has committed, whatever its uh, signifiers are, whatever its uh, uh, self-image might be, it is simply a fantasy. It has no reality, and therefore it cannot be an obstacle. It does not pertain to you. It has nothing to do with the self. The ego's state is irrelevant. And it is when this is fully comprehended, because the ego itself cannot comprehend this. You see, this is the problem. This knowledge will slip away from it almost instantly, and you'll go away saying, what did he say? It was a nice sermon, but I didn't quite remember what he was talking about. Because the ego mind can't grasp it, it doesn't exist. It can't tolerate that kind of information. And so you can take notes for years writing down, ego does not exist. (laughs) But who's writing it down? It's the ego. 
And uh, the ego isn't going to stop believing in its okay. existence. But the ego's pseudo-existence is not a problem when you realize you are not the ego. There is nothing to extract yourself from. There is no progress you have to make to be able to make the ego more discerning. It's never going to discern its illusory nature. And if you continue to believe in it and worship the ego, because that's really what it is, the exoteric path is a path of ego worship. And, and therefore it's no different than not being on a path. Th that's why uh, Trungpa called it spiritual materialism, right? Because you're assuming you're an ego who is a material being trying to become spiritual. But you've already defeated yourself in the very beginning by assuming materiality when it is matter itself that is the dream from which we must awaken. And so if you begin assuming that the state of consciousness of one being asleep is one's reality, then it's going to make it very difficult to awaken from a dream that you have now, uh, you have now asserted is reality. And so it must be recognized that the ego being only a fantasy of the mind that continues to propagate itself with words and images in the mind and actions that will be self-fulfilling justifications for belief in the ego, like see I'm a sinner, see how hard it is, see I fell back again, blah, 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 all of those self-defeating, sabotaging behaviors of the ego are specifically designed to keep you from being awakened. But when you ask yourself, what is real? What is real that does not change? What is real? within the self, within the I. If it is not the words of the ego, if it is not the body identification, then what comes, and again, this is congruent with every spiritual tradition, is that there are three reals. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, for example, they will say that the Buddha nature comes in three forms. And they correspond to what we call real three, real two, and real one. The Dharmakaya is real three. The absolute, the emptiness that contains all, but has no qualities, no attributes. The ego can't grok emptiness even though that emptiness is filled with infinite potentiality, it can't grok that. It's too much, it's overwhelming. So there's real two, which in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition is called the Sambhogakaya. This is the Buddha nature in its form of exquisite enjoyment of creative intelligence, of love, the divine love level of reality in which one dreams the world as infinitely beautiful and it is perceived that way because it is real. And then you have real one, the nirmanakaya in the Tibetan Buddhist vocabulary. The Buddha as appearing as a bodily being, Shakyamuni, right, Gautama or any manifestation of an avatar, any manifestation of a sage, 
But any sage will tell you, but I'm not the body, I'm not the nirmanakaya. Uh, maybe speaking through that, but that's the Buddha nature's portal into this plane of samsara. But the what is speaking to you is is an energy of love and of joy and of intelligence that comes from the dharmakaya, which is infinite and includes all of us as a single intelligence, because there are no differences, there are no separations. So when any sage comes to tell you is you are that, not that you should worship that or try to become that or emulate that or imitate God or try to become good and, uh, and, and eventually you'll be hit with the thunderbolt of illumination. No, not that. It is the you are already the dharmakaya that includes everything but has no qualities, no identity, no essence, no essence in the sense of any way of being that is palpable. But it has infinite potentiality of manifesting as essences, as flavors, as rasas, as exquisite enjoyments. And so the rainbow spectrum of chakras that gets projected into apparently the physical form, but actually we know into the consciousness in its seemingly manifest form, are those vortexes in which one is able to expand consciousness into a boundaryless condition. Because the ego is bound, it is contraction, it is the self-binding of infinity into the finite form. Okay, that is what it is, self-limitation of that which is unlimited. And then in the chakras you can dissolve those boundaries. But there are different ways of dissolving boundaries and some uh, actually are, are superior to others. You can be, uh, lose your boundaries in autism or psychosis. You can lose your boundaries in suicide and, and in despair in which you dissolve your consciousness into a malignant depersonalization. All of that can happen in chakra one. If you want to go back to the womb and dissolve into the uterine mother, and you'll find some way to do it with drugs, but that will provide some backlash and side effects you may not want. Or you can try to dissolve in a sexual encounter, dissolve your boundaries in the physicality of the other and the emotions and the powerful energies that will be aroused and released in such an event. But again, there'll be a backlash afterwards and a suffering and remorse and a recognition that, again, you created an attachment to limitation. Or you can dissolve your boundaries in fury and go berserk and temporarily think you're all-powerful and infinite. And, of course, you'll find yourself the next day probably in jail or dead, but you, you will have a temporary experience of that boundarylessness. If you join the army, that's what they'll try to give you, and it, it will it'll give you drugs to help you go berserk and, and jump out of the airplane and your parachute and hit the ground running with your rifle and, and involved in combat in which you will have no ego temporarily and pay a huge price for it when your ego and its moral values reappear sometime later and produce post-traumatic stress. Or you can dissolve in divine love. And that's the preferable portal to the entrance into the infinite ways of dissolving into the transfinite, which is an infinity of infinities. And after divine love, you can dissolve into divine wisdom and have an infinity of, of, of conceptualizations of that which is indescribable that can get to ever more uh, subtle levels of the infinite dimensionality of God consciousness. 
and there's no end to it. You can lose yourself in chakra five and write a zillion books and never come to the end of what could be written about consciousness because it is endless and infinite and, and it's in the gems of wisdom that it can reveal to a consciousness that focuses on it. But you can also go beyond that and dissolve into the chakra six, the Agya chakra, the chakra of the luminous command of nature, the light that underlies and pervades and structures all appearing forms. And you can begin to gain those cities that have to do with overcoming the apparent laws of nature. Or you can go beyond that into chakra seven and dissolve entirely into God consciousness with no trace of any separate entity remaining and nothing to return to. And so you have your choice in this smorgasbord of salvation that you're offered in every possible way from the ego's bondages. But only a very discerning intelligence will know which vortex to dive into and will know who you are who has created all of these vortexes as opportunities to know the infinite self within a finite context. But can the knower ever know itself? Mm -hmm.